Welcome back, enamel enthusiasts. I'm Sandra McEwen, and I'm here with my very good friend, Lillian Jones. Welcome, Lillian. Hi there, enamel enthusiasts. Yes, we are enthusiastic about enamels. <laughs> anyway, I have been friends with Lillian for many years, and you actually taught me everything I know about enamel. I took my very first class in enamel with Lillian, and so thank you. Well, I taught Sandra all I knew in about an hour, and Sandra took off with it like a rocket. Wow. So I don't think you can give me all that much credit for it, but okay. Well, well welcome, welcome. Lillian, uh, you were, as friends, Julie, were chatting, and you sent me some lovely photos of some sample strips that you had made that I found fabulous, and I thought we should do a video about them. Well, thanks. The sample strips that I made are a result of watching Sandra's really excellent video of making sample strips. And although <laughs> I've made sample strips for years, Sandra's sample strips were better than anyone else's and I just had to make some. Although I made a few alterations to sort of take into account the style of enamel that I'm trying to make these days. Excellent. Well, we should start by taking a look at the sample strips. Okay, that sounds good. Here are the sample strips. So Lillian, why don't you tell me a little bit about what we're looking at here because it was these samples that you sent me a photo of and I was like, look at, they're, they're very much like the samples I make, but because you're doing all this interesting texture, you've actually done a texture on your samples. And Lillian, why don't you tell me about them? Well, first of all, I guess what I would say is Sandra's video inspired me to make them this size, which is one, inch by one half an inch with the same structure of a useful sample strip which is a bit of gold foil, a bit of clear enamel, and a bit of bare metal so that you see the reaction of the enamel over all three of those surfaces. And the additional uh, feature that these have is that I stamped a little circle and the reason I stamped the circle is so that I could see how enamel laid in the circle and outlined the three-dimensional properties. And because that's the kind of work I'm working with right now, um, that's what I needed. So this is obviously an incomplete, this is just, I just started this a couple well, of days ago. It's a good progress. <laughs> and but, so these are kind of pieces that what are these little guys? Well, that's these are pieces that I wanted. I, I found, say, for instance, this color right here, which is an obscure Bovano blue, and I, it had the characteristics I was looking for: that the circle appears dark and the uh, thin layers appear light. So I put some over a dimensional surface to see how well it delineated the shapes mm -hmm. and I thought this turned out very well as and that's just a single color on there it's one color it's probably two siftings I think I sifted yeah. it directly on no it's beautiful because it looks like there's three shades of blue on that right right well and then to to contrast this there's this piece right here so the sample strip that the sample piece I had for this was this color right here and I had hoped that this color would work well, but as you see, it's muddy down in that circle, mm -hmm. and it's equally muddy down in the low spots here. So this would be an example of where I wouldn't want to use that color for this particular, however mm -hmm. beautiful that purple might be for a cloisonne project, it's really not going to work very well for, is this Vasatai? Yes, nice? but how, we have to get we have to get our friend Olivier to say these French okay, words. Okay, right, right. Um, so that'll, in that'll any be case, the next video. This is this tells me that this is not going to work. Oh, what purple is that? Because you know everyone. Well, it ask. says right here it is a Thompson 109, 109. purple. In other yeah, words, nobody can purple. find it anyway. That's so right. don't worry though. Exactly. But it's a pretty purple anyway. So. The shade is so nice, so it's disappointing that it's not going to work for you. No, I agree. And what are these? Well, guys? I would like to say that. When I've done um, a lot of cloisonne enamel in the past, and mm -hmm. the challenge with cloisonne enamel is obviously color combinations. Yeah. And what I'd found was that when I made a good color combination, uh, the piece sold, and I didn't have any <laughs> record of what I had put yeah. with what to make things really look good. So I made these, um, they're essentially 
color palette samples mm -hmm. and just on scrap discs and on the back I would write down oh, what the colors I used were. And so you've got whole series of colors that work that play really well together. So you, oh I love this one. Right. Gosh. Exactly. And um those are lovely. Okay. So just to illustrate once you got a color palette the the benefit of it is you know working on this and you can see how I'm able to choose colors that come out of my palette and be reasonably mm -hmm. assured that the finished product is going to be pleasing. Yeah, will go together with itself. Beautiful. And another example of that is this piece right here. Swirls, you know me and swirls. Yeah, that's beautiful. You don't have to use everything. I didn't look like I used that white, but yeah, still. Yeah, it's just safe. A lot of times you go to a lot of work creating mm -hmm. the underneath part of an enamel, and the colors, you know, you want some security. Yeah, great. So three dimensional enameling, you would start with a basic shape that you've. And I love, oh my gosh, I love this turtle. I love all of these little creatures. They're so sweet. And you making these on the hydraulic press? I am, I am. So I carve out a mold out of brass and, and make these on a hydraulic press. And then I fuse, in this case, I'm fusing on um, mm -hmm. this, this outer yeah. edge using blue fuse. Nice. And oh wait, hold on. Shameless plug. Okay. <laughs> there you are. Did blue you fuse. invent blue fuse? I certainly did, and no. it's a, it, just specifically for this purpose, it's a fusing agent that'll allow you to fuse either granulation or for this kind of enameling. And where can we buy this this well, nectar I'm of so enamel? Glad, <laughs> glad you asked, Sandra. My Etsy page. Just go to Etsy and put blue fuse in, and it should pop right up. Excellent. So I will some. also put a link. In the, in the show notes. Thank you, thank you. Excellent. All right, so anyway, we've created this little creature, and now we need to enamel it. And if everything goes well, you get a really pretty um, version of it mm -hmm. with the enamel on it. But everything doesn't always go well, and I have yeah, a good yeah. example of that. This is a little hummingbird. See, I like your good examples, because I still think that that's not a bad example, but we'll get to it. All right. Well, this this in my mind is the mm -hmm. the basic unit. I've yeah. I've uh, created the image. I've fused a wire mm -hmm. border around it, and so I you to fuse it after you've done the, the the pressing of it. Yes. Oh yeah, I guess yes. that makes yes. sense. Yep. And then I enameled it, but as we see here, the the gold enamel yeah. went opaque on me. And it did get a little cloudy. Right, and as gold is famous for doing, mm -hmm. as I'm discovering when I make, you know, yeah, gold yeah. enamel over silver, it doesn't stay clear. It's yeah. had to, cadmium in it, I think, is the reason. Might be, yeah, and it gets a little darker with every firing. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and this initially mm -hmm. was very pretty, and yeah. then became less and less pretty. So this, on the other hand, is an example oh, that's of beautiful. if you choose the right set of enamels, you can get the image it pops off the background in a nice dimensional way and yet it still has some sophistication and shadowing in the thinner areas. So this might be one or more colors of enamels but that first layer right mm -hmm. directly up against the silver has to be right and give you the right look it's and then you can build on it. Yeah and so are you doing any kind of a base coat of clear or are you going right to colors with these? It really needs right to color because yeah. you need the color to lay in the um, crevices oh, yeah, cool. and look and be yeah. become deeper colored in the cracks. Hence, you need to know if it's reactive to silver even more. Exactly. Neat, exactly. Neat. So yeah. that's why this whole set of enamels uh, samples. This guy. Yeah, I think that one didn't please me. It's not awful, but it's not very clear. Yeah. The, the animal doesn't really jump yeah, off the background. The whereas if you does. get a better color combination, then you you choose mm -hmm. wise more wisely you can see it better just beautiful right neat all right
right, so um, what are we looking at here, Lillian? Well, these are examples of sample strip ideas that I've used in the past, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that because, you know, every 10 years or so I'll make more sample strips. I think probably this mm -hmm. is the first. It's done on copper with a silver foil, white enamel, and copper. And that's all right for a beginning, but... And I know, think I've seen these at the Craft Center at NC State. Sure. Yeah. That, that, that's sort of <laughs> typical of what you might do in a school environment uh, because you're working over copper. Mm -hmm. However, I am a exclusively work oh. over silver. And this is a little piece of silver right little here. little piece of silver. Mm -hmm. You know, I sort of don't really want to spend a lot of money on the silver that goes into the sample strips, but you've got to have them over silver, so... You know, every once in a while I'm tempted to test out a bunch of colors on some scrap. I, have, I think I have that exact same piece of scrap. Exactly. And, you know, so you learn something and you forget it 15 minutes later because mm -hmm. A, it's not labeled, and B, you know, you have no idea what it was you were doing or trying mm -hmm. to do and what those colors were. So yeah. it's, it's just an exercise in temporary gratification and you're going to have to figure out how to recycle this piece of silver. So, you know, not a good solution. A slightly better solution is doing a color combination over a piece of scrap and then at least labeling it so yeah. you know what colors they are. But I can't really say that this is the most useful as sort of microscopic. Mm -hmm. um, well, I could see it would be hard to see how like this blue is going to work next to that because there's so many different things in between. Like you have to visually parse it. Right, right. And if well, I were going to do yeah. this, I think I'd be more inclined yeah, to go and do the... Where's Jibba Green? Yeah, where you could just actually physically pick these up and see how nice they work together. Right. And so this really just kind of falls into the category of temporary mm -hmm. fixes. Stop I, gap. Yeah. So, and then again, we've got one of these. So, so what is that? <laughs> it's just a piece of scrap that I wanted to look at purples on because right. I didn't have color samples. So yeah. now I'm making the color samples and I don't have to waste all this scrap silver. I can just recycle it directly. Mm -hmm. nice. The other thing I have done in the past was take a little circle and put it um, on the circle, put the circle on the lid to my bottle. Oh and put the, so, you know, the problem with that mm -hmm. is the circle A falls off. Oh, yeah. And B, you can't lay it up next to another color to see how it mm -hmm. might, how it might work. Yeah. So, although this is sort of helpful and it's really not a very good idea. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. If we start making a sample strip. Sure. How, what are we going to do first? Well, in order to save money, I started with 32 gauge fine silver. You can use whatever you want, but this seems to work, so it's going to be less expensive. I have a nice cutter. I know, I like this cutter a lot. I'm going to... I have to... All right, so I'm going to cut an inch, and that gives me two strips that are an inch wide. Nice. Now I'm going to quickly adjust the setting on the cutter to a half an inch. Oh, yeah, I have that arm, but I haven't set it up. I just... Um... Oh, it's, it's useful. <laughs> oh, wait, hold on. I'm not even showing that. There we go. All righty. Yeah. Now, it's just straightforward to nice. make a series of... Oh, I'm totally setting that thing up on mine now. The, the, the stop thing. Last one can go a little out of whack. Yeah. All right, there we go. Twelve little pieces. Excellent. Just to introduce you to my little low-key kiln setup, I have a lot of bigger, fancier kilns, but over the years have discovered that I really just prefer this very small tabletop kiln because the work that I do is small size. It heats up quickly. You can throw it in a shoebox when you're finished. Is this a beehive kiln? It is an ultralight kiln. An ultralight kiln. Where an could I purchase kiln. this lovely kiln? Um, I think Rio Grande carries them, and I think there's another, the manufacturer I want to say is TEC Products. All right. In any case, this is not quite the way it came. It comes with a little um, aluminum cap, but I have put a little plate, aluminum plate, mm -hmm. to boost the heat. Nice. So what I'm going to do here is just really simply, you, you could take the lid off if you want uh -huh. and 
lay your pieces of metal in it. And why are we heating? Why are we annealing our metal? I'm annealing this silver because when I go to uh, punch the surface to make that little divot, I want the silver to be nice and soft. And immediately, the way it comes from the manufacturer, it's hardened. So Even though it's fine silver, it's still a little too hard. Exactly. This uh, mm -hmm. and you're just really has just... to lay there instant, just an instant, yeah. and it's done. So about the amount of time that it takes you to take a few in and to take a few out, pretty much tweezers is good. There you go. How many have you melted? I have <laughs> melted. If you leave them in there, if you wander off the fingerings, you'll come back and find a little bead of silver just laying there. Nice. So. Great. That All right, so we're going to do the texturing. And what do you have, Lillian? This is just a... Um, a little round punch, mm -hmm. a piece of leather, and over a rubber sort of hockey puck yeah. thing. And did it you can, make that punch? Um, I think I did actually. Nice. Just, but you know, this is not something that's very hard to find. In any anything will mm -hmm. work. All yeah. you really need to do is put a good sized dent in it. So line it up, press down with the punch, and <laughs> give it a nice whack. Nice. It's gonna deform the metal, but we're gonna fix that in a minute. Uh huh. Excuse the noise. Great. Okay. Let's see what they look like. Right now they look <laughs> fairly damaged. Well, neat though. So for our next trick, we'll just. Clean up the the damaged sections. Oh, just, just flatten them out. Yeah, we'll just flatten them back out. That's what you're after. Beautiful. All right, Lillian, uh, let's let's go ahead and make some samples. What have you done to further prepare these pieces for your sample strips? Okay. As your wonderful video illustrated, uh, put a nice heavy coat of clear counter enamel on the back. I put clear, I think this is N1, but you used N3, but a mm -hmm. clear Japanese enamel coating about the bottom two-thirds, mm -hmm. and then I fired on a little piece of gold foil, which is a little dark here, but it'll brighten up when it's got the enamel over it. Now, do you find that it's important if you're doing, do you, do you always have to do an unleaded base coat with unleaded enamels and leaded base coat with leaded enamels? No. Um, I've frequently used Thompson's clear unleaded base coat and used leaded enamels over it. Mm -hmm. The um, I think I don't think you can use a leaded base coat and unleaded over it. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I've been told. I've never actually tried that. That could be a sample strip for another time. Sure, we can see <laughs> if it if it works. But okay, so here we go. We're going to next thing that's important is to we're going to try this uh, nice opalescent Nina Maya pink NG three forty one and. I think it's important to write down on the piece of paper exactly what it is you're planning to use on this piece of paper because it's really easy to lose track yes, of what you've done. Absolutely. So we'll do that one and we'll do a yellow over here. Oh, hold on, let's see the yellow. It okay. is N27. Yeah. And that's another Nina, Nina I, Mia. It is almost, yeah, I use almost exclusive Nina Mia. Mm -hmm. Old Thompson are good, but they're hard to find. Yep. Don't and, we know uh, it? <laughs> but there are other vendors and other issues but all right so what I'm going to use is a little piece of wire that I've been myself this is nichrome wire mm -hmm. I order this from Thompson so you're like me use my finger nichrome yeah and it just seems to work well in an enameling environment uh -huh. and because there's not a lot of heat in the little ultralight kiln mm -hmm. you need to keep your pieces very close to the surface mm -hmm. I mean this is just a very low-key low-tech approach yeah 
but you have to make certain adjustments. And the ordinary enamelless trivet doesn't work very well yeah, with this. Yeah, it's so shallow. Right. Now, will this wire melt? Does it have a... A melting it, point? You know, that's a good you, question. I've never, never melted it. All right, well then probably, so, I think it's safe to say... We hope um, not to do it today on film. Exactly, that would be embarrassing. All right, so we've, Sandra has sifted this, and maybe you want to talk a little bit about oh, sifting. Oh, um, what am I talking about? Sifting. Why, oh, why yes. is it sifted? And well, I like to pre-sift. Well, you know, in my original. Um, oh, that's nice. In my original video, I said you don't have to sift your enamels to make your sample strips, but I've since changed my mind about it because I like to see the clarity. And you get a better sense of the clarity if you've pre-sifted before you make an enamel strip. What grade did you sift it with? I sifted it with, um, I'm gonna say it was 200. 200? Yes. All right, so there he is. I set him right. Because I'm not using any sort of um, glue. glue to adhere, the, this, you have to have a pretty steady hand, and let's just <laughs> hope this goes well. Um, I'm gonna use a pair of long needle-nosed pliers to grab hold of this piece of wire here. All righty, let's do it. And hope it all stays put. There we go. Now we're gonna very carefully, and this is another reason why sitting using a tabletop situation works really well. If you had to walk across the room like this, it would not go very well. I know. So we've slid him into the kiln. And when will it be ready? It it'll, doesn't take very long. Um, what is the temperature of that little kiln, do you know? I'm hoping it's about 1500. Mm -hmm. It stays at about a steady 1500. Now you could take the lid off the kiln and uh -huh. set it in just more traditionally and that's not a bad way to do it. But because I'm sitting down low and because I have access mm -hmm. just right through this little port, I just tend to do it that way. Yeah. And I keep this all like it is and if I'm doing a whole batch of them. I'm going to move over here uh -huh. to Mr. Yellow Enamel and while that's in there cooking oh, yes, let's do that. I'm going to sift N27 on this piece so that I'm not just sitting here listening to the radio. Well, look at you multitasking. Exactly. See, I don't know. I feel like I would, I would forget that I have the thing in the kettle. You can do that. You can do that, but it's probably not going to overfire. These yeah. little kilns are one of the beauties of them. And another thing you can do is, you can see, is he cooked? There we go. I think oh, nice. so. Oh. All right. Hold on, let me get it. Nice. His color is going to develop mm -hmm. as he cools. So I'm going to set him right here on this steel block to cool. All right. And I'm going to very carefully take Mr. N24. Ooh, this is not for the shaky person. I know. And set him down. Okay. Right. In the meantime, I'm going to pop him off and get ready for my next. Actually, in this case, uh -huh. I'm going to put a second coat on this one. So I took him off, but now we're just going right back on there. Yeah, hold on. All right. Let's go ahead and rescue this one. Oh my. Ooh, Look wow. at that. It's a little Oh, that's neat. Can you see the color of that? That it's is It's really gorgeous. interesting. Let me get and you can watch as it cools. I don't know if this is sophisticated enough to show you, but the color lightens up as it cools. Really beautiful. That is I love it's kind of like a, almost like a it's a very green yellow, but mm -hmm. it's very vibrant. All right, you can even just oh. while it's hot, whoa, oh. you can set it over here to cool. And I think... And we'll, you normally do two coats on this? I'm going to do two coats okay. on it. Do you do two coats on I do. Okay. I think two coats is a good sense of the color. Yeah, one coat just doesn't really tell you yeah, I don't think I've ever put a know. single coat of a color on anything anyway. All right, so we're going to go, without taking him off the trivet... And put, he doesn't stick to that trivet. Yeah, it doesn't seem to. Oh, nice. If it does, it doesn't seem to make any difference with what's going on. Totally gonna get some All right, this is the left-handed uh, insertion. Oh yeah, so hold on. I think we're successful. All right, now I'm gonna take this one. There we go, and second coat for this little guy. Boy, this is an incredibly vibrant color. That's gorgeous. Go? Don't you wish we could have that color but not have the greenish tint? <laughs> 
a lot of times you find that, I'm going to leave this here because yeah. you can put two of them in at once like mm -hmm. this, but if I'm... Let's not, let's not poke the bees. Yes. Right, exactly. He's a little... And how long does it take for this kiln to heat up? Um, 20 minutes. Not bad. Usually I'll come in, flip him on, and go make a cup of coffee, and by the time mm -hmm. I'm back, he's ready to go. And he's just literally on off. On off. It's very plain. You can what what I have here. I think I can show you without burning myself. Mm -hmm. Is a metal plate that you can purchase with this kiln that is marketed as a, oh, a like, heat increasing uh -huh. lid. And since I just want the maximum heat, yeah. And then I set another little thing on top of it. I don't think you even need all of that, yeah. but it sort of keeps the heat more encapsulated yeah. and less in the room. All right, so we'll pull out this one and set them there to cool. Yeah. Obviously, you don't want to set this on a piece of paper right now because yeah. it's going to burn it. All right, we're going to put all this one back in. So about this time, this is yeah. hardened up enough that you can pop it off and let it this uh, steel block acts as a heat sink, so it allows you to manipulate your work a little faster. And lift him out. Okay. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, it's... He's a little orange peely yet, but yeah. I think I'm just going to go with it for right now. That'll be nice. Yeah, it'll be nice to see how that looks when it cools. It's really pretty color. Good cool. gosh. Unfortunately, as it cools, the heat, the orange of the heat slowly disappears, mm -hmm. leaving you with the yellow of the chrome that yeah. makes up that color. Yeah. And, and it is often the case that they really are beautiful Don't when they're you red hot. Yeah, you, I wish you could say, like, <laughs> stop. Those yeah. are the perfect colors. Exactly. Especially when you get these really elaborate shades of browns and greens. Mm -hmm. They're just lovely. Yeah. All right, well, let's let these cool, and then we'll have a close-up look at what we have. Okay. All right, well, here are our final sample strips, and I think they look beautiful. Yeah, this is an opal. You can see it's kind of cloudy down there and cloudy mm -hmm. all over, which is the point of opal. And then this has a brilliant That one is a sleeper head. Yeah, all captured underneath the glass. And you're always looking for that. If you're working with silver, that's what it's all about. It's that getting that beautiful... Um, mirror-like finish underneath the glass and capturing it, the color. Nice. All right, so to recap, this one was NG341 on the left. I don't think that's too big. And this one was N27 on the right. Beautiful. So now you've got some homework for all, all the kids to do. <laughs> well, let's, let's add one more piece of information that I think are important. Yes. You need to be able to write on the back of it. Oh, yes. What you did. Before you forget. Before you forget. I found that I have, I think, literally, I can't even remember after dinner what this would be. Right. So, what are you going to write with? The first thing that comes to mind and is probably the simplest solution is the Sharpie. Yes. So, for now, because we want to walk away from mm -hmm. this, I'm going to write on this with the Sharpie what it is. I would say that will last pretty much a week. Just like that, if you write on it with the Sharpie. Yeah, fingerprints. Mm -hmm. It just will wear right immediately off. The next solution, if you want something that'll last a couple of years or maybe a year, is you write on it with the Sharpie and you put some clear tape over it. Yes, that's. I'm in that level right now, but I, I found that my tape is deteriorating and falling exactly. off right now. That's why I'm in the process of trying to figure out another solution. All right, so the next solution that I would suggest is some kind of paint and I have here a I have like an enamel paint that gets fired yeah well that would be ideal but you may not have that on hand so I went to the store and bought some glass paint this is designed for painting on glass when you want to make some fancy pictures on your oh, wine like glasses wedding, or something wedding exactly. favor right and this you can pick up at your local hobby shop little bitty yes, paintbrush yeah and you can paint on that and i think that's going to hold up i would say that would give you a couple of years mm -hmm. of use and then ideally 
you would have a china paint sort of solution yeah. that you painted on there and you fired it in. Now, a, another possible solution, if you don't have china paint, you can... And do you think, would you do your china paint before or after you've done the sample? Cause I think I'd do it after. Yeah. I think I'd do it after. But another thing you can do is if you have um, etching, glass etching cream on hand, you can etch oh, it yeah. and write on it with graphite and then fire it lightly and the graphite will fire right into the glass surface and give you mm -hmm. sort of an easy way to keep track of it. Yeah. But keeping track of it is the important part. Well, I have to say that I tend to go the lazy man's route and still do the Sharpie. I made some yesterday, and I did the Sharpie and tape, even though I know I should spend a little bit more time. Right. Well, I'll go back this afternoon. I'll take a little alcohol, wipe that off, and I'll paint it on with this. Nice. And um, usually I'll do a whole batch, label them up mm -hmm. with Sharpie. This is the easy way. And once I've got a bunch of them, I'll go back and change out the labels. Yeah. Hold on a second. I'll show you one. It's not quite as elegant because the painted yeah. letters aren't but quite as good. But you know what? It's about the information. Exactly. Excellent. So, and you leave yourself a little room to attach the magnet, yes. which is the next part of this. So. Great. Excellent. Well, thanks very much. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Lillian, for sharing your beautiful studio with us. I think we had fun today. I did. Thank you for joining us. And if I wanted to go to your Etsy store, where would I go? What is your Etsy store? When, what do you have at your Etsy well, store? Well, the Etsy store is primarily for selling this product, Blue Fuse, which is a fusing agent for pure silver and gold. And I use it for enameling, but I also use it for uh, granulation. Ah. So these are sort of meta techniques that most jewelers do try at one time or another. And um, Sandra suggested I put some jewelry on it, so... <laughs> like, did you really need me to suggest No, that? I mean, you just don't know me that I'm going to put oh my God. this beautiful jewelry. Yes, I would totally buy this on Etsy. Okay, all right. So, um, I think it's Blue Fuse Studio. Or I'll put something. a link. I'll find it and put a link in the notes. Or okay. we'll put it right here. Like, magically make it appear right okay. here. Sounds great. You know. Thanks. Anyway, yes, and I teach classes, and you can come to Raleigh and take a class, and maybe meet Lillian as well. Maybe she can be a guest star in one of our classes sometime. I would love that. So, but again, thank you so much, and um, happy enameling, everybody.